See how many you are. You are about one tenth of the Irish Brigade. And I want you to think about how long it took us to go two blocks just to get here. And what that would have looked like if we were 10 times our number. And what that would have looked like when there are 35,000 other soldiers in this town. Fredericksburg has never seen a traffic jam like December 1862. You have to have a really good roadmap to figure out how to move units around the downtown from point A to point B. We also do it under shell fire and our cannons out on the edge of the town, a mile behind you, already playing on this city, searching for the Union soldiers in its streets. The only thing that a soldier can say works for him today is the weather. Just like it works for you today. We've been doing this walk for over three decades. And we've seen all kinds of weather together. <laughs> Last year, we started in an ice storm. And when we finished, we all had about four inches of snow on our equipment. My flat hat looked like a, pretty much a wedding cake. <laughs> <laughs> and yet today, it's in the mid fifties. And we're out here in light gear in December, 1862, which day was more like their day. Last year's snow or this year's balmy weather? Last Last year's year's snow. It's today. Oh. It's today. Many of the veterans later on in their twilight years would remember fighting in the snow, but it never happened because the temperatures were about 56 to 58 degrees. Today, we're expected to go to 56 degrees. It's almost precisely the temperatures they have. We have no snow, neither did they. But they did have mud, lots of it. And as you trampled the roads, you trampled through mud. When you go out on the field, you lay in mud. You wallow in it. And unlike snow, Mud saturates uniforms. Wetness permeates the fiber. It gets right down to the skin. And tonight, when the temperature drops, it did the same in 1862. And while it didn't freeze, men had hypothermia. So even when it's warm, it's not necessarily the best thing for you. So bottom line, nothing is working for the Union soldiers. Not even nice weather. Union soldiers coming down this street have one particular soldier to thank for chronicling their movements. His name is William McCarter. He was a fellow in the 116th Pennsylvania Volunteers. He had never been in a battle before Fredericksburg. He would never be in a battle again. He would get wounded seven times today. Seven. And his body will be so crippled, he will be unable to keep up with the soldiers. And he'll be sent home, discharged. But his body is so badly wrecked that he will never be able to resume his previous employment as a scrivener, a professional handwriter. After the war, he petitions Washington for a pension for his disability. And he deals with what we deal with because Washington is bureaucracy. And when they have to pay you something, you 
have to jump through flaming hoops to get it. And William McCarter's world was no different. He had to fight with the pension office. So much so, he moved from Philadelphia so that he could be there in Washington to argue with them. <laughs> now, moving down from Philadelphia, where did he move? What did he make his home? You're standing in it. The place that destroyed his health became his home because this was the defining moment of his life. One day, defined his life. And he would hobble up and down these streets, remembering what it was like on December 13th, writing about it in newspapers, in a memoir for his children, and he gave us landmarks and explained step by step where they go and why they did it. He tells us that they left their encampment down on the city dock where we left. They marched north on Sophia Street or Water Street, this street that we're on. They crossed the railroad. Today it's elevated. 1862, it came in at street level. We would have had to go over the tracks, not under them. He said just shortly beyond that, the whole brigade stopped, which is where we are now. The reason they had to stop is that there is a massive traffic jam up above us. And Hancock, our division commander, is riding down that road to clear the street so that we can march. It's going to take about 10 minutes. And in the 10 minutes, we stand here. This is not an easy spot to be in. William McCarter tells us that as you come down this street, every cross street that faces the Confederates on Marie's Heights is being pummeled with Confederate artillery shells. And that they literally come streaming down those cross streets. So when the brigade marches, they have to run past the cross streets and then hide under the cover of the houses on the other side of the street. As they reform and wake, they see the first tangible sign of the battle going on outside the city. They hear the show. They see them come whistling by. And now... They're going to see the wounded and the dead being brought back from all the previous attacks. Remember, there's a goodly portion of this brigade who's never been in a battle. They've never seen combat. They've never seen such profuse bloodletting. How does that impact them? The 116th Pennsylvania are going to see the sublime and the ludicrous all at once. They're going to see an officer being carted to the rear, wounded, and they're going to drag him in a wheelbarrow somewhere they liberated out of the brickyard beyond the edge of the city. But they weren't very good at navigating the wheelbarrow, and it kept threatening to tip over. The officer was an immigrant like the Irish, except he was German. And as they came down the street, they went right past the Irish brigade, down the length of their rank. And the wounded officer just puffed on his pipe and gave direction to the guy wheeling the barrow, repeatedly saying, Nick Links, Nick Links, Rex, get out of house. Not to the left, not to the left, to the right, straight ahead. <laughs> now, how many people thought we're going on an Irish tour? We're going to hear German today. Yeah. <clears throat> but that was their introduction. And what did you do? You laughed. What did the Irish Brigade do? They laughed too. Because it was ridiculous. Shortly after that, another wounded soldier was brought back. His wound 
was his leg was destroyed by a shell. He was still hanging on to him by one tendon. They didn't have a stretcher for him. So somebody ripped a shutter off a house and used that as a stretcher. And as they came in front of the 116th Pennsylvania, the man's leg fell off the side of the shutter and just dangled, swinging back and forth. The Irish soldiers didn't laugh this time. They started yelling, put him down. For God's sakes, put him down. The people on the shutter did not listen. They kept on walking. One of the Irish soldiers stepped out of ranks and with a bowie knife, cut the tendon. The leg hit the ground with a thud. And the poor sufferer smiled in relief. And two soldiers in the brigade fainted dead away. Their introduction to battle. And they had only gone one block before they were out of combat, simply by listening to the thud of a leg. Our world just got very serious now. That awaits this brigade. And yet, we have a sense of duty, and we will keep going. After 10 minutes, General Maher is going to ride down from this direction towards us. He'll race down the front of the brigade, assure himself that everybody's here. He will race back to the front, unsheath his sword, and give the command to the Irish Brigade to proceed. We're going to keep moving. We've opened up the road. We're going to move. When we do this, I want you to look at every cross street. And remember, shells coming down those streets. But when you look down the cross street, also look at the lay of the land. Because just beyond us, two blocks away, is a ridge and a plateau. As we move further into the city, the ridge will get more pronounced and will give us more protection because the Confederates can't see us marching down along the riverfront. The Rappahannock River is just in front of you. The Confederates are just behind you. And we're gonna maneuver between. 